Well, my name is Dr. Ni Adi. I can describe myself in lots of different words. I'm a neuroscientist. I'm a mentor. I'm a research advisor. Uh, I'm a mental health advocate. I'm a person of faith and a follower of Jesus. So in terms of the research, what we do in the lab is to truly really try and understand what's happening in the brain and how that contributes to good mental health and mental health challenges. In particular, we focus on three areas, addiction, depression, and anxiety. Those are our three main areas of focus. We're trying to see what happens to contribute to those and how we can actually give people some relief from some of those mental health challenges. So our work in research is something that implicates and influences and has a lot to do with what we think about as a society. Uh, so mental health is a topic that really touches all of us. Most of us can think of family members or friends who struggle with mental health challenges at some point. We can think of instances in our own lives where we may have had moments of anxiety or times of feeling down or even potentially depression. So I think this is a topic that really resonates with a lot of folks. And what we're trying to do is to really help us as a society have a better understanding of what happens in the brain during these different mental health states and if there are things that we can actually target from a therapeutic or pharmacological sense to help bring some alleviation to these types of things. So most of our work is done in rat models where we can look at specific behaviors that might be directly correlated to different mental health states. So in rat models, we can actually look at things that reflect anxiety or things that reflect some of the symptoms potentially of depression or things that reflect the symptoms of addiction. And to be able to understand what's happening in the brain during those states, how we can change those brain processes with drugs or therapeutic interventions and bring some relief. So a goal of a lot of our work is to understand those things and then take them into clinical settings where we can do the same type of research to see whether that has alleviation for people that are struggling with these same challenges. So sometimes people wonder why we're looking at rodents, rats and mice to try and understand what happens in humans. And it's a great question. I always joke that you can't really ask a mouse or a rat, are you depressed, anxious or struggling with substance abuse? But there are certain ways that you can look at specific behaviors that also relate to what we think about in humans. So there are certain tests that we can do that can give us some insight as to whether a, a mouse may be feeling more comfortable in a specific arena or more anxious and less likely to explore. We can look at things like motivated behavior. How much will the animal work for a highly palatable reward versus just taking freely available rewards that are less, uh, less rewarding? And these are the types of things that we think about with depression as well. Rodents will also take drugs of abuse that humans will take, and we can look at relapse behavior. And the critical piece here is there are similarities between the rodent brain and the human brain, so much so that we can get insight from looking at certain chemical responses in the rodent brain that correlates to what would happen in a human as well. So there's lots of different examples where things are first looked at in a rodent model, where you can use very powerful biological tools that gives insight about how humans may potentially react in a similar situation as well. So it gives us a really powerful tool to look at some of these pieces of science with powerful behavioral tools and powerful methods, and then to apply that to our further studies, which we eventually will perform in humans in clinical studies. So one of the things that's really important for people to understand, but it's also very challenging for people to understand, and even for us in the field, is trying to have an understanding of why changes in the brain react or are correlated with specific illness. So I think a general principle that's really good to take into account is that changes in the brain influence our behavior in a lot of different ways. And that can be for good or for bad. When we learn something, there's a change in the brain that occurs that allows us to remember that. A lot of times in the field, we'll talk about things like synaptic plasticity. And neuroplasticity itself has become somewhat of a buzzword in the popular lexicon these days. But that can also happen in negative ways. So if someone undergoes a traumatic experience, that can also ch cause changes in the brain. That can cause a plasticity where, at, where recalling those traumatic experiences can actually cause them to go into a tailspin or have periods of anxiety. An extreme case of that would be post-traumatic stress disorder. But a key piece to remember is that all of us are undergoing changes in our brain when we learn or experience different things. And so it's a little bit of a continuum. Those changes are naturally occurring in all of us, but sometimes those changes can go to an extent that it leads us to into an area that would be maladaptive or harmful or what we might consider to be a pathology. So for instance, when we think about someone who's struggling with substance abuse, if they go back to a particular environment, cues in that environment may cause them to have a craving and to relapse. So there, those changes in the brain have actually made that situation more difficult in the sense that now they're going into a craving and relapse mode or is that something we would try and change or alter or reverse? In other instances, we can have things of learning that would be good. 
So it's all a continuum and it's, a, it's more a matter of the output and whether that leads to a maladaptive behavior or something that's harmful to us as people. So sometimes people will wonder about the differences and similarities between a habit and an addiction. So I think it's helpful just to describe the definition of what we consider a habit in the field. So typically we'll talk about a habit as being something that develops over time. So initially, someone might perform a certain action in order to get a certain outcome. So I might go to the vending machine because I want a candy bar. I put my money in, I know I'm gonna get the candy bar out. Over time, things develop into a habit when the action no longer produces the desired outcome, but you continue to do that habit. So if I went over to that vending machine, put money in and didn't get anything out, but I kept doing that over and over again, that would show that I've developed a habit. It's no longer a response to what's happening, but something that I do over time. And there are different areas of the brain that come online when we switch into a habitual type of behavior. So some of those concepts also happen in addiction. So for instance, the first time someone takes a drug, they may take the drug in order to get high. Over time, that high no longer comes, but they continue to take the drug. So in that sense, they're acting in a habitual mode where their action of taking the drug is no longer dependent upon whether they get high or not. So that's a very concrete example of how an addiction has habitual concepts related to it. So there are lots of different concepts that come into play when we think about habit. So to give an example, if someone has a habit of drinking coffee every day and they miss a day of drinking that coffee and they feel a physical manifestation of that later on, then the question becomes, was that something that was in their mind because they missed that habitual drinking of coffee that they had? Or was that something that had to do with the lack of caffeine itself? And the answer to that is not always very clear. So I'll give you an example of why that might be the case. So if someone has a habit of drinking coffee, there are also other components that come into place. So there are cues in a certain environment that remind that person of drinking coffee. I can put myself in that same situation. And sometimes the cues themselves can cause the same actions in the brain that the reward will cause. So if I like drinking coffee, and if that causes certain chemicals in my brain to be elevated, sometimes just having the coffee in my hand or buying the coffee will cause those same chemicals to be elevated even before I take a sip of that coffee. So I don't know if anybody's had the same experience as me as you get that warm cup of coffee and all of a sudden you feel a little bit different. You feel a little bit of soothing. You feel almost as if you drank the coffee itself. So missing the day of coffee, you don't only miss the coffee itself, but all the other cues that are associated with that and those all lead to brain changes. So it's a difficult question as to whether it's the lack of the coffee or the lack of the cues that leads to that different feeling later on. And this is broader than the habit itself, but it shows how there are all these different components that can contribute to that same experience. So I would say that I came to faith prior to getting into my profession. So at a young age, I had the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And as I was growing up, also had the opportunity to see him at work in different people's lives. So I can distinctly remember times when I'd be working with the homeless who had also proclaimed Christianity, and they would give away half of their food every morning to those in need. And to me, that was a really powerful statement about someone who was in such dire conditioning or a dire state, having this strong sense of God in his life and being willing to share that with others in a very tangible way. So for me, my work actually is a reflection of the faith that I already have in the sense that I feel like I have the opportunity to learn more about God's creation, specifically thinking about the mind, and also to learn more about how our mind works and ways that God is allowing us to learn more about how to bring healing to that in certain situations and certain forms. Going back again to our main research questions of really trying to understand what's happening in the brain during periods of depression, anxiety, and addiction. So I would say my research helps me understand my faith again by giving me a lens with which to look at what I'm doing in a laboratory setting. So it's always a good reminder to me that even though I'm studying the basic biology of the brain and how that's important for different behaviors and mental health states, that's not all there is to it. There's a much bigger picture that's involved as well. And I have the opportunity to be able to focus on this specific area, but knowing that this is all part of God's greater creation. And I'm always very cognizant of the fact that the biology doesn't work in isolation. So we also have to think about the other factors that play a role. These include environmental factors, social factors, cultural factors, as well as faith and spiritual factors. 
So for me, it gives a context to the work that I'm doing and helps me keep things in perspective. So in a lot of ways, our work has contributed to some of the ongoing work in the field that's been giving insight into what happens to the brain during specific triggers, during specific episodes where triggers can facilitate relapse or actually lead to episodes of depression and anxiety. So the field has been very receptive but because we've been able to add to the mechanistic understanding of what's happening in the brain. So to give an example, we've identified specific channels in the brain that can be targeted or that we can focus on using antihypertensive drugs. So these are usually given for hypertension, but they also have actions in the brain. We found that giving those drugs can also decrease relapse behavior. But one of the things that happened with this and one of the reasons that it was accepted by the field was because it actually acted in a way that was counterintuitive to what had been shown before. So it seems that this drug actually decreases craving response by increasing a chemical response in the brain that before we would have thought would have made craving and relapse worse. So sometimes in the field when something is counterintuitive, that grabs people's attention because it shows us a new insight into a way that we may be able to have some therapeutic implications and therapeutic potential for individuals that are struggling with relapse. So I would say there are a lot of things that excite me about the field moving forward. One of the things that's clearly evident in neuroscience is that it's a field that encompasses several other subfields or subdisciplines. So when people go to graduate school to study neuroscience, they may be in different types of labs. They might be in a lab that uses things like pharmacology. They might be in a lab that focuses on psychology. They might be in a lab that focuses on physiology, so how things actually work in the body. They might be in a lab that focuses on genetics. So there's a lot, there's a lot of power in that and being able to integrate these different fields and different perspectives to look at neuroscience questions. But I would say one of the things that excites me in particular is not only thinking about that within the realm of neuroscience, but also thinking about that in a much broader context. So taking our neuroscience understanding and neuroscience insight and making sure that we integrate that more broadly when we think about mental health. So again, thinking about these social components, thinking about cultural components, thinking about psychological components, and thinking about spiritual components. And I think there's a lot of power that can come from actually integrating neuroscience with these different areas as some are already starting to do. So I think an important question for me as a neuroscientist and a question that others and even you may have is who cares? So why look at the brain and why try to understand what the brain is doing in these different states or these different processes in the first place? So obviously that's a huge question and in some ways I think it's something that all of us have to think about and answer. But to start out, I would say there are several things that are important in addressing that question. So as I've mentioned, there are specific processes in the brain that are directly tied to behaviors that we do in our everyday lives. And sometimes some of those behaviors aren't good behaviors, they're maladaptive to us, especially when we think about things like mental health challenges or mental illness. So there's a power that comes in understanding what underlies that and why those things occur. It also gives us a window and an opportunity to try and change those things as well. So that's part of how I'd answer the question. But I think another way to answer the question is again to think about who cares in the broader context. So how do those things that we understand integrate with other aspects of our lives? How do they integrate with the social parts of our lives, the cultural parts of our lives, the spiritual parts of our lives? I think all those things are important for us to have a whole life in the sense of what it means to be human to understand what's happening in the brain and how that contributes to our whole life and how that's integrated with several other aspects of our lives as well. So a great thing also to consider is whether there is pushback to this type of thought, like why study the brain in the first place? So sometimes there is pushback. So people will say things like if someone is struggling with anxiety or depression, they should just pray over it. They should just trust God to heal that area. So why do we need to study these types of things? And even in instances where people might not say that explicitly, it's implied and you can hear it in the question. But I would argue that God has given us tools to be able to understand what's happening in our own brains. And that's a gift in a sense. So a lot of times we'll talk about that being meta or metacognition. So if we have this tool to be able to understand it, this God-given tool, we should take full advantage of it. That's a way that God has allowed us to bring healing. So while you might pray over something, we shouldn't ignore those other components as well. 
A humorous example I often give is if someone breaks their arm, very rarely will you hear someone say, I'm just going to pray over it and I'm not going to go to the hospital. Well, the same thing when we talk about the brain and mental health. We have tools to pray over it and also to address these things from many different angles. So we should take advantage of the full array of gifts and tools and knowledge that God has given us.